going to share with you my thoughts about silence and stigma in the hopes to get us all talking because I want to talk about mental illness. So from a really young age, I've always loved music and I continue to love music because it often communicates things that people cannot find the words to say. So since I was four, I've been a classical pianist and one of my favorite parts of my lessons was always when my teacher and I would put the dynamics in the music because for me, that's when the piece would really spring to life. So some of my favorite composers like Beethoven, Schumann, Tchaikovsky, and Rachmaninoff all suffered severe bouts of depression throughout their lives. And I found that oftentimes you could hear their turmoil in their music and the sounds and silences that they put in place strategically in their pieces. So <clears throat> I'm someone that doesn't take a lot of time to slow down. I'm actually surprised I'm talking this slowly right now in all aspects of my life. <clears throat> and this also applies in my experience as a classical musician. So musical scores feature rests, which indicate the length of time a player should pause to give silence between the notes. Silence. See? I've come to learn that silence is not always golden, especially when we're talking or not talking about mental illness. So I imagine this idealized world where we all have a more humane, less ignorant, more understanding idea around mental illness. Stigma is defined as a mark of disgrace, which is often associated with an attitude, person, or thing. And stigma is learned. It's taught in the ways we interact with each other and through our internalized attitudes. And just like how stigma is learned, eliminating stigma can be taught as well. So I love to dance but I want to stop dancing around the issue of talking about mental illness because we need to eliminate stigma from our vocabulary. So, question, do I look like someone who has a mental illness? Spoiler alert, I've never personally had a mental illness, but now that we're all thinking about it and getting the conversation going, what does mental illness even look like? Is it this painting, The Scream by Edward Munch? So this painting is being used for years as a marker of mental illness. And just by using this painting to show stigma in art is another way in which we stigmatize. Or is this what mental illness looks like? Clara Hughes, sixth time Olympic medalist in the summer and winter Olympics combined. Now, I don't have an athletic bone in my body. I caught a ball for the first time in grade eight gym class and people clapped and talk about it till this day. <laughs> That's not a joke that I wrote just for this, that's the truth. Um, yeah. um, so despite all of her impressive accomplishments, Clara says that she's most proud of her work as a mental health advocate. So Clara recently became open about her struggle with depression several years ago and has since been a passionate and compassionate spokesperson for Bell Canada's annual Let's Talk Day. So this is a day that happens once a year and recently passed on January 28th. And millions of Canadians spend the day tweeting and texting to raise money for resources for Canadians across the country to help people struggling with mental illness. It also aims to help reduce the stigma associated with mental illness. Now, this is a day that's fantastic. Bell Let's Talk Day encourages people all across the country to tweet and text and talk about mental illness, but it also leaves many key issues surrounding mental illness on the periphery. So, I love this day because I love tweeting and I love texting, but at the end of the day, it's the end of the day. And by the end of the week and the end of the month, the talking dissipates. It's almost like if National Coming Out Day were to happen and everyone that came out of the closet on that one day went back to being in the closet once the day was over. So something that I've learned is a lot of the ways in which we use language comes from the ways in how we talk about mental illness. So basically, like when I'm on social media, I see that when someone is sick, even with the flu, someone is posting on their wall things like, get well soon or feel better, but we never see that same open, outpouring support for when someone we know is diagnosed or struggling with a mental illness. And so 
I wonder about this. Why aren't we supporting people in the same way as when they're sick with a mental illness and when they're sick with a physical illness? And so the answer isn't simple. Um, it comes from the stigma in our society. And basically, um, the stigma is growing. And we need to have conversations because by having this stigma, we've pushed the people we love and care about into closets, which are dark and frightening places. The people we love and care about are living in closets filled with masks and various fronts that they feel forced to wear. And we've lost the keys. And frankly, I think it's time to go and find them. So something that's been in my closet until today was the anxiety I experienced in connection to my piano studies. So as I progressed in my piano studies, I developed tremendous anxiety in connection to my performance as a player, which is kind of odd because performance is kind of my middle name. I've grown up my entire life performing in all things musical, from musical theater performances to singing competitions and dance recitals. Basically, if I could get anyone to watch or listen, I'd be performing. And even if they weren't willing, I'd still be performing. And so this anxiety was really odd. And it completely took over my life at the piano. And it got to the point where I made my family completely readjust their lives so that I could cope with my anxiety. <clears throat> so I would beg my family to leave the house while I practiced. Or if someone stayed home, nobody could so much as sneeze while I was at the piano. And I would sit at the piano for hours, practicing technique and pieces that I learned for months over and over again. And when I would get up from the piano and walk away, I would pause. And I would run, literally run, back to the piano. And as we've learned, I'm not athletic. And I would go and play everything I just played for fear that I had forgotten what I had just learned. And so in the days and weeks of approaching my piano exam, I was more anxious than I'd ever been. And um, my longtime piano teacher, Carol, who is without a doubt the best therapist, mentor, life coach, piano teacher I'll ever have, looked at me and said, Piper, what's the difference between not going to the exam and failing the exam? I'm not going to have any less respect for you if you choose not to go, but I'll have more respect for you if you go to the exam and fail than if you let your anxiety win. So I didn't let my anxiety win that day. And I'd like to give you a reason why I have and had so much anxiety around my piano studies, but I don't have a reason. Um, it just happens. And despite the tremendous supports of my family and my friends and my piano teacher, I was petrified. And I don't even know what I was so scared of. So deep down, I sometimes think that it was the pressure I put on myself to do well, or the fear of messing up, or losing my place in the music. And I think this buildup manifested itself in anxiety that was situational to my piano studies. So the likelihood that you or I will develop a mental illness at some point in our lives is incredibly high. The most recent statistic from the Canadian Mental Health Association indicates that 20% of Canadians will experience mental illness personally at some point in their lives. That's one out of every five people in the room, so we could go and count, but that could take a while. Um, anyways, so basically, we're all affected at some point, and the ways in which we use language is really important, and we need to start the conversation. So I come from this family where we talk about everything. Seriously, you name it, we have talked about it. Anyways, so I was home for winter break, and my parents, sister, and I were back at it. We were talking, and we were faced with the challenge of talking about something we had never really talked about before. We reflected on when a time when a cousin of mine, who with whom, despite our age difference, I'd always been extremely close, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and our family seemed suddenly silent. Now, I even remember being told by older relatives in hushed voices to not talk about it. But what was this it we were so afraid of? And why did I never even think to ask that question? So, and I realized that my family was complicit in the silence and stigma surrounding mental illness. So while away at school, 
I've noticed that a lot of the stigma surrounding mental illness comes from the ways we use language. For example, a lot of the times my friends and I will say things like, oh, the amount of homework I have is so depressing, or that test tomorrow is going to make me kill myself. I mean, I've said those things, and probably recently. And this language isn't something I'm proud of or something I'm imagining, because it's everywhere, and we don't even realize we're doing anything wrong. I mean, when talking about someone who has a mental illness, we usually say things like, yeah, Jane, Jane is bipolar. In fact, Jane isn't bipolar. Jane has bipolar disorder. You would never say something like, yeah, Ken, Ken has cancer, or yeah, Bob, that guy, he's renal failure. Because with any other illness, we separate the person from their illness, but we never seem to do it with mental illness. And why is that? So I imagine this ideal world where we think and use language and speak in ways that don't create stigma and engender the silence. I mean, why is it that when someone we care about is diagnosed with cancer, we can't stop doing something about it and talking about it? We drive these loved ones to their appointments, and we sit with them, and we wait while they have their treatment. But rarely do we see anything similar happen when someone we know or care about is diagnosed or struggling with mental illness. And we listen to all the gory physical details of someone talk about their experience with cancer, from the pain to the fatigue to the treatment. But we never enter a dialogue of the same caliber when someone we love or care about is struggling with a mental illness. It's time we break these silences and we unlock closets and we find the keys so that we can finally bring stigma out into the light. Someone who has recently found the key to their own closet is cartoonist Ali Brosh. So Ali Brosh created this blog, Hyperbole and a Half, where she was able to use this medium to channel her comedy and to talk about the ways in which she had experienced depression. So um, one of my favorite newspapers, The Globe and Mail, talks about Ali Brosh's quote, the unlikely poster girl for depression. In fact, she's the unlikely social media darling of depression who uses comedy and crude and cogent, powerful images to get us starting a conversation. So one of my very best friends recently broke her own silence around her struggle with mental illness. And this girl's amazing. She's a fantastic friend, a published author. Mount Allison recently gave her a huge scholarship for her extraordinary academic achievements. And she's avidly involved with a club at Mount Allison called Change Your Mind. And this club is super cool. So what it does is their goal is to talk about mental illness and try to eradicate the stigma on university campuses surrounding mental illness. And so I don't know how my friend does everything she does. And frankly, I don't know how anyone with a mental illness goes through their everyday lives because I've never had to personally experience a mental illness or the stigma that accompanies it. And my friend is always saying things to me like, Piper, I don't want to burden you. But in my experience, being there for someone with a mental illness has never been a burden. I've just reminded myself that what's happening inside their head is dark and frightening at times, and it's our responsibility to try and help them turn on a light. I want us to all turn on lights and zero in on the stigma surrounding mental illness. We need to start a dialogue, a two-way conversation. My cousin and friend both told me I could speak about them today on the condition that I didn't use their names. And I view this as completely understandable, but also sad, because it's a true testament to the extent that mental illness is stigmatized within our society. And at times in our lives, we all face challenges and periods of darkness, and in those moments, it's terrifying to be left alone. So then why do we leave the people we care about so much alone in dark, deep closets when they're struggling with a mental illness? It's time we unlock closet doors and have uncomfortable conversations. We need to start asking people questions. We need to change the ways in which we use language, and we need to finally bring stigma out into the light. Once we unlock those closet doors, we need to lose the keys forever. The first act of love is paying attention, and it's time we start paying attention to the conversations we are having about mental illness.